a moment, you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today is one of the most exciting days. I've been so excited to finally have the opportunity to speak to LL Research. I, I'm nervous. I don't know the, the proper words to say, but just honored to be in the presence of these amazing people who have shepherded the Law of One channelings and information and knowledge and research through the years. For people that have followed the podcast, I've discussed extensively the incredible contributions of LL Research, the Law of One, and in particular, the Quo channelings. And we now have Gary Bean, Austin Bridges, and Jim McCarty all together, a significant part of LL Research, who uh, maintain a lot of the Quo channelings. And I have so many questions and so many wonderful things. LL Research has done so much. Just to speak before we, we start going into questions, the contribution that LL Research has given is, is beyond what many people can truly fathom. Uh, if you go on their website and go through their channelings, they have channelings all the way back to 1972. It's very easy when you go into a website and you just see the, the every every once in a while that little channeling and to um to think, oh yeah, this is just another website. But if um, if you're like me, I, I like I love the, the the physical books. I have an entire bookshelf that is completely filled of just these amazing books that are just transcripts of different channelings. Um, there's so many amazing books just. It just goes on and on and on. And I can just sit and open up any of these books and they're amazing. And I have this theory that in the future, there's going to be institutes and people reading this stuff like scholarship. The information is transformational. And in LL Research is changing the planet, changing the earth by channeling and bringing this unique and powerful information into our lives. And now... We have a role to try to digest this information and apply it to our lives and understand it. LL Research began in, in, in 1972 and through many different channelings, eventually the, the, there was the raw material, um, which it, it began in the 80s. And I got a chance to discuss that with Jim McCarty. But since that time, there have been the Quo channelings and a number of other different channelings that LL Research has conducted that have been incredibly helpful for those on the spiritual path. So I finally got a chance to talk with them about the, pro on, and we're going to talk about the process of channeling and many of the different subjects and topics that come up in their channeling. So thank you so much for joining me. It is an honor to talk with you. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Glad to be here. Um, thank you I, so much, Brian. Th thank you so much for coming on. You guys are so humble and so awesome, but I wanted to first, before we start, uh, get an idea of how Austin and Gary got involved with LL Research. I know the whole origin story of, of Don and Carla and Jim, um, but what the amazing thing is that um, Austin and Gary have come along and they're, you know, transcending a new generation with LL Research continuing this message, maintaining the integrity of this message. And it gives me hope that this message will continue and LL Research's um, amazing channelings and other contributions will continue far into the future. How did you guys get hooked up with LL Research? Tell me what happened. Uh, I, I guess in, we'll go chronologically and start with me. Uh, Brian, thanks so much for that introduction. I'm excited to meet us <laughs> uh, with an intro like that. I think it's helpful to remember that uh, we too are the beneficiaries of this work. Uh, the Confederation channeling is a source of inspiration and light that guides each of our lives. So um, I guess short version, I met Carla and Jim in 2002 in Louisville, Kentucky, two years after I had discovered the Law of One. So I've been reading and studying the Law of One for 23 years now. Uh, I was 20 years old at the time. And um, uh, fast forward Several months later, Carla and Jim invited me, along with a couple other people who were in their house at the time, to launch a spiritual community with them in their home. So shortly thereafter, I moved in with them and lived, uh, had the honor of living with and working wow. with and supporting Carla and Jim uh, for several years. A few years after that, Carla 
was basically the one uh, running LL Research, and she wanted to be freed up to focus on creative work, starting with Living the Law of One 101. So she uh, invited and insisted that I become her administrative assistant. It was the first um, formal role uh, for LL Research ever created. And since then, I've been um, serving LL in a formal capacity um, from, yeah. And then I'll turn it over to, to Austin. That's the short version of how I got involved. Awesome. Yeah, so um, I discovered the law of one, it was around 2008. Uh, my timeline's a bit fuzzy, but had a big spiritual awakening around 2008, discovered the law of one. And I was reading the books for a few months, like the physical books, before I thought to myself, uh, these people might still exist because it felt so obscure to me. So I did a search online for LL Research and found out that they do still indeed exist. They were still channeling and they had an online community. So I joined the online community and I got involved and um, got to know Gary a little bit that way. And then eventually he asked me to uh, help moderate the forums as a volunteer. And I very gladly accepted did and did that for a couple of years before I finally met him and Jim and Carla in 2012. I came to the 2012 homecoming event and um, things were very harmonious. And at that point, Gary was working in the office and um, needing a little bit of help in the office. So a few months later, they invited me to come help Gary out in the office, move to Louisville, help him in the office and uh, be part of LR Research. And I've uh, been an official part of LR Research ever since. It's amazing. And it's, it makes me feel better that, you know, that there's, that this is going to continue and you guys continue to make it better and better, constantly improving the website and learning more. And I, I, I it feel like I get to know you guys through the channelings and the contributions that you make. Gary has written some amazing books um, about the, the, the law of one that have helped me to understand it. And, and, uh, you know, Austin is, is, is regular in, in, in responding to messages that people that contact. So thank you guys so much for that. And, and I really do feel like I've gotten to know you guys from the Camelot journal, the Jim's day, uh, Jim's daily blog that he puts out and, and, and Carla's writings. Many of those are personal. I get, I've gotten to know Carla and her personality Beyond just the channeling, she was an amazing, intelligent, uh, powerful person who was this amazing writer. And I feel like more and more as I've read her contributions that I, I, I got to know her and this amazing person. And so um, it's I, it's wonderful to have that aspect of the LL Research group in the community. And and, and so that's why I'm, I'm so nervous in talking to you guys. So um uh, there's some interesting things that, uh, you know, I, I found in researching um, LL Research as I've read about it, but... Um, I should let you know, we do have more staff. Oh, yes. I, as I read on the website, that I, I, I invited you guys, but we also have Joanna and, and, and Trish. Who else? Tell me the other people that are contributing um, to okay. the law um, of one as well. Right. And Daniel Shields is our webmaster. And Daniel, uh, okay, Daniel Fields. So we have... Uh, three other people that, that are at least pictured on the website. Um, and, and they're free to, 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 to join us, as I had said. Um, and I'd love to know uh, about their contributions. They're also part of the channelings as well, correct? Uh, yes. Trish is the only other one that's part of the channelings. Okay. Um, Joanna and uh, Daniel's on another continent. Joanna's on the other side of the country. Uh, okay. Uh, Trish was going to stop in and say hi today, but she was very busy and actually she well, asked. Please tell her, um, you know, thank you so much for her contributions. Uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, so the, the as we discussed in our first interview, and as people that may have known about the Law of One, the initial channelings for the raw material uh, definitely need to be made into a Netflix miniseries. There's so many amazing things and stories that go along with that. Um, but as you explained, it it, it it was draining for Carla. Um, it was it, it it felt somewhat dangerous. You were breaking new ground. It was revolutionary. Um, so um, out of the raw channelings, which involved uh, you know extensive rituals and and there was actual physical um, uh, results that came from it. You guys started doing the quo channelings, and the quo channelings involved the addition of additional social memory complexes to sort of 
help with the group chat if that's the best way to, to explain with it so so you you had the in, in addition to raw you had a group called hatan and latwi and interestingly if you go through uh your channeling archives you um, also channeled a number of other entities um la lima and some various others that i find interesting so uh it's the the quo channelings have really helped to uh, cement the law of one teachings from the raw material to help us all understand in because um they're uh, they're being done consciously but for many people that access those channelings they're easier to understand and they're um, more topical about what's going on in their current lives and it, it it appears that those channelings have been going on for almost 40 years now um and so it's it's been interesting to follow the channelings as as Jim pointed out in a recent channeling, his your history with ch channeling quo. I saw your first channeling as you had pointed out, and I've learned a lot about channeling through your discussion of quo. So uh, it, it, it's exciting whenever something new comes out with quo. Tell me a little bit more. I'd like to know a little bit more about the quo channelings. You have given us first of all. Uh, we have a, a general idea of what sort of rituals that you did before you did the raw material. You gave a specific ritual that was specific to that experience. Uh, I don't know if maybe I've missed it because there's so much material. If there's a specific ritual that you go about um, in starting the quo channelings, when you do them, uh, do you, you you do the the banishing ritual, of course, and there seems to be a tuning process. Do you guys keep that quiet or is there a specific way that you start your quo channelings when you go about the process of channeling quo that that you you duplicate whenever you do your channelings? Was that too complicated a question? Does that make sense? No, I, I think uh, Jim is talking about the origin and history of quo and rituals. So Yeah. Well, um... As you said, uh, I do the banishing ritual in this room, in the living room where we have our channelings mm -hmm. every day. And that's to protect and purify the place of working. That's for everybody that's here. Each instrument that channels Quo has his or her own way of tuning and getting ready to do the channeling. We usually do that off uh, in my bedroom uh, together. And this is a process that Carla taught us all um, back in 2008, when she held a special channeling circle, that um, we needed to be able to find a way that meant uh, the most to us to be able to tune. And the tuning pro is probably the easiest part of the two-part ritual. And uh, the other part is the challenging of entities that wish to speak through you each time that the channelings are undertaken. And what Carla suggested there was that each one of us, anyone who wants to learn to channel, would need to determine what part of their spiritual journey was the most important to them. What was the heart of their journey? What was it that they live for? And if necessary, would gladly die for. So in Carla's case, uh, that was also uh, the case for me later on, it was Jesus. When she was uh, two years old, she had experiences with Jesus that she immediately became a disciple and follow Jesus for the rest of her life. So anytime any entity would want to channel, channel through her, she would challenge them in the name of Jesus Christ and say, do you come in the name of Jesus Christ? Can you say that Jesus Christ is Lord? And she would do it three times, just to be sure. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and in effect, what that is uh, in the metaphysical realms or the uh, spiritual realms, it's as though Jesus is standing next to her and uh, protecting her and, uh, I don't think anybody in the metaphysical realms would lie to Jesus. So that's the process that uh, each of us goes through each in our own way. And we each have something that is that quality that is the heart of our journey. And that's what Carla recommended that anybody who wants to channel would need to do. So I'd like to get a history about um, actual times when you rejected channelings that came through oftentimes in reading the transcripts you guys don't include when it's somebody that's rejected it just shows after the fact like you can go hatan or whoever you are that you're not the real hatan right so, can you tell me some experiences have you had some experiences yourself or seen others 
that clearly were started to receive a negative entity. And when you challenge them, what happened, um, as I see a lot of other channelings when I'm following the internet or people post channelings, clearly this is not something that is being done, uh, that people are not channeling the entities that they're that are coming through. And this is a really important thing that, uh, that LL Research has taught us the process of challenging the entity in the process of channeling. Can you tell me more about maybe some experiences where you where you you know challenged and the entity left or or anything like that? Gary Austin, do you have an experience to share? I don't think either of us would have an experience to share because for the most part, Gary and I and Trish and our other channeling circle member, Kathy, um, we've only channeled outside of Jim's living room a small handful of times. And when we do that, Jim's always the lead channel in the living room. So uh, have you ever had any experiences, Jim, of having a contact that you couldn't accept? Not in these recent years. Uh, during the raw contact, uh, when we were living at Maradison Trail, and having our uh, Sunday night meditations, there were a couple of times when Carl and I each felt that there was an entity attempting to channel through us that was not of a positive nature. And uh, when we asked Rob about that, they suggested that this was our fifth density negative friend that was attempting to channel through us, but uh, that it was not having much luck with it because they had not been in that type of a situation. Before, So it was at this time that Ross suggested that we have a means of challenging an entity to determine what, who we had on the line, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, that has been my only experience. It happened uh, in my private meditation and in my public meditation, and it turned out to be the negative entity. So that's the only time it's ever happened to me. Have you ever felt like there there has been a return, even not through channeling, of that fifth density entity that is so written of in the rock contact, as well by Carla in some of the quote channelings? Have, has that fifth density entity, um, you know, wanted to return to the party at all at any point? <laughs> well, during the rock contact, he was he or she uh, was always with us, right, and was providing what we called psychic attacks or psychic greetings that were meant to uh, attempt to stop the raw contact. And we discovered that uh, that was something that could happen even with pre-incarnated choices. Uh, Carla's choice to have uh, rheumatoid arthritis as a means of limiting her experience in the outside world and keeping her focused on inner work like uh, prayer, meditation, and channeling, that that choice of arthritis could be enhanced so that the pain the normal pain could be increased. Mm. Uh, also, any type of choice that we made that was away from the highest and best we could uh, promote in our daily lives. If we made a disharmonious choice, in other words, that could be accentuated too. So the way that we were told by those of Ra to deal with that was to use meditation to see, again, how that psychic greeting was offered and to send love and light to the entity that was sending the greeting, send love and light to the greeting itself, and then surround ourselves with an armor of light. And this is not done just to make them go away. It's done because you truly send them love and light. They are our other selves that are on a negative path, but we will appoint some in the future, be with them again, and we will be one. We are one already. So, it just so happens that love and light is something that they're not, you know, happy with. Right. So they, they take their leave. So it was exciting to read in a recent quo channeling. I think that you had a larger group setting where you did the channeling that you, you could see Carla, you could see her. Um, and it was, uh, it, it, so I'd love to give a greater explanation. Um, you felt her presence and uh, it, you know to little, learn a little bit more about uh, what had happened at that channel, if you know what I'm referring to. I think that's Prague, Gary and Austin. Let's talk about that. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Austin, Trish, Kathy, and I had been learning channeling with Jim in the privacy of his own home in a non-public setting. Uh, at first, that was just a function of uh, learn of our training. Um, and then the pandemic hit and uh, LL had suspended 
channeling public meditations for a bit. So we continued on a private basis. Then comes Prague. We hold a law of one gathering in that city last summer. It was our first gathering in three years, also due to the pandemic. And uh, Austin, Trish, and I were there, and we were all invited to channel in a group setting, a setting of you know 30 plus people from all over Europe. It was quite daunting to us. Uh, one, that it would be our first time channeling in front of others. Uh, two, uh, in a law, at a law of one gathering, no less, with a lot of others. So we were hesitant mm -hmm. at first and didn't commit, but come the weekend of, uh, Austin performed the banishing ritual in the room where the channeling might take place every day just to be ready in case and i think 24 hours in advance we decided okay let's let's take the leap let's do this and uh sunday then afternoon at the close of the weekend uh, we gathered in a space made sacred with intention and ritual and uh, following a uh, group tuning, we gathered in the room to channel. And uh, as just prior to people streaming into the room, Trish had a very uh, intense and vivid experience of being greeted by Carla. Uh, she could see Carla and interact wow. with her and um, was very teary eyed as a result of it. And Trish would be better able to share her experience but the gist of it was that um carla was very encouraging toward all three of us as we are um, uh, moving over this new precipice and uh, a little admonishing <laughs> saying uh <laughs> lighten up guys it's basically it's all right you're gonna do great i'm um uh, trish had a sense of uh she carla was seeing uh us as her proteges and she's saying you know like you're doing great work and continue. And uh, Trish shared that just as uh, just before the channeling, and it was very encouraging. And then during the course of the channeling, uh, it came through as well that that Carla was joining us. But um, I, Jim has had uh, many experiences, of course, uh, with of course. Carla, and I, w we presume that she's with us constantly it just uh, was in this particular case that Trish had this special experience and I think that was a function of Carla wanting to uh, encourage us and you know make her presence more known I mean I tell you Jesus somebody that that reads these all the time I feel like I feel her presence too and I've never met Carla I've felt her come through in my dreams um she's she has a sort of sense of humor uh, it's it's amazing <laughs> I, I I think um, you know, when I when I read that, I was like, "Wow!" You know, I I I could resonate in, um, with that, and I'm sure. Um, I'm, of course, she's with you. Of course, I mean, she's there. She she built this <laughs> with you guys. So uh, I would love to get there's there's some interesting tidbits or factoids from the raw contact that I've you know in 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 reading so much, and maybe Jim could share a little bit more. You mentioned once the the hexagonal silver flake flex that would come up with Don and Carla when they, when they would either channel or, or, or when they would talk about spiritual things. And you actually had, they would, they would end up on your body and you had a, like a, like a bottle that, that Carla had um, keeping these silver flex. Is this a true story? And do, did you um, ever witness this, Jim? Uh, yes. Uh, this is something that happened on occasion when, we were gathered together just sitting in the living room and talking about one thing or another. And if we were talking about uh, spiritual activity or a thought, something we wanted to do, uh, sometimes a, a flex over or sometimes golden flex would appear on one of their arms or um, usually the arm, sometimes the face. And that was supposedly a confirmation from our subconscious minds or maybe our guides that uh, the course of action we were considering was an appropriate course of action and i think that uh austin may have got a silver fleck or two haven't you austin uh, yeah and it wasn't really just me i was the one who found it but um i think gary remembers the circumstances a bit better but it was around the point where we were uh, publishing the raw contact which is sort of the the new improved version of the raw contact transcripts and um, we were in the office and I don't remember it was just on my desk but it was a little silver fleck hexagonal silver fleck 
And I have a very skeptical mind. Uh, so anytime something like that happens, I'm like, it's probably not at all the same. It's probably nothing. Right. But then when we looked at the silver flicks that Jim has saved, he keeps the, there's in like a little container. Um, they looked exactly the same. Like it was pretty much exactly the same as the ones before. And then um, I think Gary had a, another silver flick experience too. I did a 10 day silent Buddhist meditation retreat last year and mm -hmm. um, had a, uh, an experience of one manifesting for me in the shape of a teardrop, which was uh, relevant because I had had a third eye opening experience at the meditation retreat and had a very strong visual of um, the pineal gland secreting something in the shape of a, of a teardrop. But uh, we, the, the one that Austin was talking about, I'm pretty sure it was on one of the books uh, right. I wrote it down somewhere and we preserved that one and the one that uh, I discovered as well. And there is an essay about that, a short essay in the history and origin section of LLResearch.org, if anybody's interested, along with pictures, if you want to see what these little doodads look like. I'm, I'm so fascinated. Have you ever had an analysis done of it or anything like that or no? No? Nothing no. like that? <laughs> I, I'd love to talk more about the, the the research aspect of LL research. You you have this tremendous archive of information. I mean, for some, it could be overwhelming. It's just so much that you have talked about. Literally anything that you can think of on a spiritual level, on in any even religion. You all many times questions were asked, and clearly you guys knew you wouldn't get an answer, but you just threw it out there. Just just cross your fingers. Maybe this time they'll. They'll, they'll give us a little bit more because you kind of know they well quo will only answer certain questions in a certain way and, and after doing it a while clearly you guys know what they will and will not answer but every once in a while you like to throw in a little question uh and so uh with that tremendous um, amount of information have you have you gone back and done an analysis for instance i think of when when Stephen King um, wrote under a pseudonym as Richard Bandler, people figured out, oh, after reading his book, oh, this is Richard Bandler, or I think J.K. Rowling and some other authors have tried pseudonyms, and, and they can do an analysis of the text of hmm. of the the book to see, oh, this is the same author. And what's so amazing to me, people are not talking about. There's ch million, there's all these channelers. You're a group that's channeling. And when you guys are channeling, clearly it's the same entity coming through. The syntax, the word use, uh, that's impossible. That, you know, most people, a portion of themselves is coming through in the channeling. But what's amazing about the quote channeling is through years and decades, the entity coming through and the words that you're using, the syntax and the exact combination of words, it, if you were to do an analysis, it's, it's the same entity. That's amazing. Have you done an analysis beyond just the actual message um, as to the content of the words, the number of words, anything like that? We've never done a very thorough analysis like that. That would be a very interesting idea to try to figure out like um, what kind of consistencies come through in like a formal analysis. Uh, in terms of like research like that, I'd say the research aspect of LL research was primarily, you know, started with Don Elkins in the 1950s. And that was right. very literal research. He wanted to research paranormal phenomenon, specifically UFOs. And uh, he got involved with like um, hypnosis regression. And that was his method of research was starting mm -hmm. to do hypnosis regression. Then he discovered channeling as that method of research. And essentially once he discovered channeling and did the channeling experiment that's been the research that we've been doing ever since is uh just collecting the data essentially and right. uh, presenting it and maybe someday we could do some kind of analysis or have somebody else do some kind of analysis but for the time being and for all, all of our research's life it's basically just been offering all of this data right. and letting making it available to people who might want to do that kind of analysis or research because i think a lot of people do pick up on what you you said these these consistent themes and the syntax and stuff like that but i um, mean a formal analysis would be really cool i think yeah it, someday somebody will, will probably do that now uh, there's a question i'd like to ask and, and perhaps jim can answer it before we get into other parts um something specific to my channel and some experiences that i've had um that was sort of addressed in a recent channeling is the concept of 
the of parallel realities, alternate timelines. And, um, you know, in a recent channeling, Quo had said that really the only reality is in the present moment. And I understand that. But I'd love to know through the different channelings, your concept of if it's sub densities, if there are, is, is, is there a multiversal aspect to the illusion that Quo is discussing? Are there par parallel realities? Or have they kind of said there isn't parallel realities except um, possibilities or potentials that are in the future? Let me know as, as scholars of the Law of One, your, your understanding of how they explain this concept. Well, I know that Ross spoke to that concept and uh, Don was asking about parallel realities, I think in regard to what uh, Seth had said through Jane Roberts. And what Ross suggested was that parallel realities could be used by the new soul within the third density as a means of gathering more experience. So if you had two or three aspects of yourself in parallel realities, you would be gathering more experience than you could if you just had one. But this was something that was reserved for the, the new soul and not something that was used by the older souls who had maybe become able to help program their own life experiences and the pre-incarnated choices with the help of guides and their higher self. One of the um, interesting aspects of, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of other channelings, many, many different entities that are being channeled are talking about reality creation, you know, Abraham Hicks, law of attraction. And that's the subtle difference with Quo. You, you have asked multiple times, how do we create our reality? Uh, tell me about the law of attraction. It's always a little bit different answer. There is a component to the positive polarity into reality creation, that it's not just about creating your reality, that there's other aspects to it. I would love to know as spiritual students and, and, and understanding the, the, the quo channelings, how the sort of difference in how they view reality creation and your understandings of it in relate you know in, in using our mind thoughts to create reality um you know as, as they teach and other entities teach as it's related to quote does that make sense am i is that too complicated is that austin yeah Gary, you want to take that <laughs> um i'll give a, a a quick reflection of my own understanding of how kubo communicates it and i'd be interested to hear gary and, and or jim's um response to that so uh, the idea of parallel realities, like you're talking about, and then manifesting your realities, like you're saying, there's been a subtle difference that I see in LL research channelings, mm -hmm. where the emphasis is uh, not so much on how do we manifest our own reality? How do we create our own reality? I th think they acknowledge that that is a valid way to look at how the universe works. But there's much more of a mechanism of using our experiences and our reality as a feedback mechanism to discover more and more of our true essential self and so it's not necessarily just that we are here to create whatever reality we want um in according to the confederation we're here to make a choice of either service to others or service to self and in the service to others path we kind of want to come into harmony with the creator with the universe and so the reality that we would be manifesting is one that isn't just based on our idea of what we want our life to be but something that honors the fact that there you know are an infinite number of individuals with their own idea of what they want reality to be and that we're all co-creating this sort of reality and what we experience is a reflection of ourselves and if there's something that we wouldn't want to change or if it catalyzes us, if it makes us feel a certain way, that's a feedback mechanism to help us learn about ourselves and help us to come into alignment with our true selves, which is the creator. And so it's less about kind of imagining something that you want that you might um, be really happy with and instead uh, being happy with your true essential self as the creator and allowing the creator to move through you to create a harmonious reality that is co-created with every individual in free will is right. sort of my understanding. Right. That, that was my impression. So the, the next thing I want to get, and it's a chance to talk to you outside of quo because they can only answer so much. And um, is this amazingly wonderful concept of the social memory complex? Uh, you know, we have this, um, uh, explanation that's given to us in the raw material of a social memory complex 
it, it, there are different ways that I can define it. It's it's a it's a group mind. It's a, it's a living entity that's comprised of multiple entity selves at the same time that can think, feel at the same time. So I'd like to discuss this outside of quote. Now that you have this knowledge that in in the universe that there are planets that develop into a social memory complex. Let's understand this as just us hanging out at the bar and talking about social memory complexes, right? Um, it, what is your impression? When I listen, let me just say this. When I listen to the quote channelings, I feel like it's it's a limited version of the beginnings of a social memory complex with LL Research. Like just the small group of you guys, the way that you share thoughts and feelings, it feels like one entity that's talking, as I said before. So is there a, a minimum number of people that can start to form what we understand as a social memory complex? Can it be like four or five, six people or is do you think that there is a, a, a numerical um, precedent that starts when a real social memory complex starts to form, or does it have to be the entire planet and we're just a part of it? Give me your impressions as you've all started to obviously think about this all the time, being that you talk about it um, with the law of one. Gary, would I take a shot on that one? <laughs> sure. So uh, Rod does describe various um levels and layers of group mind for instance this planet has a planetary mind and they also talk about racial minds racial not uh and quite in the way we understand the the way race the, the way we use that word but it can be taken to mean a sub planetary mind so it's very possible for groupings of entities i imagine anywhere from two on up to begin forming some kind of group mind experience or some kind of oversoul experience. However, I think that is still fundamentally different from the social memory complex. Mm -hmm. So far as I'm aware, the social memory complex is a planetary phenomenon involving uh, the population of the entire planet when that group mind becomes conscious. <clears throat> and it's... I don't think generally evidenced in third density. Rod did indicate that uh, as you near the end of third density, it, it becomes possible to form a late stage, late third density social memory complex. I imagine that is due to the thinning of the veil as fourth density approaches. But a, a prerequisite of the formation of a social memory complex is the removal of the veil. The veil in our experience in third density creates an illusory state whereby we all seem to be separate, completely independent, freestanding individuals, not connected to a whole, not also simultaneously parts of a whole. In the fourth density, when the veil drops, the physics are fundamentally different. It would be like gravity operating on, on a different basis. It's so radically different from our present experience that when the veil drops, then the one's thoughts, one's feelings, everything that happens in your mind and in your heart that you think is just internal to you, that that even your spouse can't see or, or your children or your, or your other loved ones, that all becomes visible. Everything that Brian Scott is thinking and feeling is visible to, to those you love and vice versa. You, you can see and know and in a way beyond an intellectual comprehension, you can feel and inhabit their experience to some degree that I that is you know beyond my wildest dreams, and um, that's true for everybody. And it's not just their present lived experience, but it's their whole history. You know, you would be able to see your loved ones every reincarnation that they've had, and then all that all that information um, is made available to the whole, and. That is the social memory aspect of Ra's term, social memory complex. Memory itself becomes a social experience. And the memory of the entire planet becomes available to the whole and sort of a repository. And with all that information, the, the group um, harmonizes <clears throat> and unifies into one being, which is what you were uh pointing to brian we're talking about how there, there's still individual identity but there's also a shared identity there is a collective identity and the group can operate on that level can actually make a decision as a planetary being that's who uh instruments like ll research are communicating with planetary right. 
beings, a, a group who was once tens of millions of people, but can operate together as one. And what does the social memory complex decide to do, but aim and orient and unify their intention and their desire toward service to others and for higher density entities that uh, can take on the form of trying to support uh, we uh, forlorn entities in third density. You can't help but contemplate this almost like you're a science fiction novelist, because this is a reality in the universe. So help me. I know that you have thought about this. You can't help but not think about it. So imagine an individual, you're an individual, you wake up in bed. What's it like when you're in a social memory complex? Um, you, you don't have a, you, I mean, you're immediately thinking of everyone's thoughts all the time. It's, it's probably impossible to actually write down if we were to novelize it and say, hey, my name is Brian, but I live in a social memory complex. I wake up and, and Joe in Pittsburgh wants, uh, you know, uh, to, to eat uh, an, a salad. I mean, how do you imagine the flavor of what life would be like in that kind of incredibly dense and complicated environment if you were to put it into words? I hope I'm not paying too much attention to uh, other people's dietary habits <laughs> in the social memory complex. <laughs> Um, I have thoughts about Austin or Jim. I responded to the last one. How about you, Austin? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I think, like Gary said, the, the reality is so fundamentally different from how we conceptualize of our whole experience that it's hard to imagine what is it like to live without a veil and to live without uh, this barrier between you and somebody else. Um, and not only you and somebody else, but you and billions of other people. I think that one important aspect to me that I always think about with social memory complexes is when you kind of hear about it and hear about certain aspects, there can be some red flags that go up that make it sound a lot like the Borg from Star Trek, basically. Like right. um, you'll be assimilated. You don't have any individuality. You're just, you know, part of a hive mind that doesn't think for itself. And I think that's not, the proper way to consider a social memory complex because a lot of what we do especially in third density before we develop a social memory complex is we're individuating we have to discover who we are as individuals in our most essential self in order to then make that leap into the fourth density and be a part of a social memory complex and so my conceptualization of a social memory complex is that we are still all individuals and we are simply individuals who are opening ourselves to other individuals as a collective effort in order to achieve some certain purpose, which for service to others individuals would be service to others. So uh, another aspect that I think using your example, I can't imagine that you're necessarily as one single individual uh, especially maybe in the early stages of fourth density, I don't think that you're necessarily like, you know what Joe is craving for. You know that he's thinking about having a salad for lunch. If you thought to yourself, I wonder what Joe wants for lunch, that's probably available. You can probably like think about that. But just like how we have sort of memories in our own repository, um, we can single in on what we want to pay attention to. We don't have to pay attention to the things we don't want to pay attention to. But then as we operate and we go out in service, the entire group mind of the social memory complex contributes to that impulse and contributes to the inspiration that we feel when we want to go and do something. Uh, if it's just having lunch, they're probably not that involved. But if it's approaching a third density planet and trying to serve them in some way, then the whole group mind is probably going to have to meld and come to an understanding, collective understanding and agreement about how that happens. And my understanding is it happens like that. It's a synthesis, like immediately your thoughts and opinions are synthesized with the rest of the group and you're all able to move as a single unified being uh, in service towards some certain end. And that's sort of how I envision, envision it. You can't help but make comparisons um, when you when you read about it to the Borg or other you know there other science fiction concepts of a hive mind. But perhaps it's you have access to it all the time, but there's still that individual consciousness that seems to continue to occur. But I mean, there's no more secrets. All the skeletons that are in the closet are revealed. So. Um, we better be ready to completely forgive everyone because everything yeah. that all my secrets and all the bad things I've done in all my lives is going to be fully on stage for everyone. And 
And hopefully, you know, we, we can start to say, oh, I, you know, I'm just the same. I get it. I had dark parts of my um, psyche. And so there's probably a period of evolution of understanding how to deal with that dark shadow on a, on a social memory complex level that, 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 it, that you have to go through when, when the veil is revealed, right? Well, I think most of the <clears throat> entities within a social memory complex have been able to use all of their experiences, all of their catalysts in order to progress on their spiritual journeys. Because one of the things that uh, Ross suggested was that in order to become the creator or to become a social memory complex, you need to be able to accept yourself for everything you've ever done and see it as a means by which you progress forward in your spiritual evolution. You are a 360 degree being. And through the process of balancing uh, all of our catalysts uh, on a day-by-day -day basis, then we become more knowledgeable of who we are and be able then to accept ourselves as being that way. And then that is an avenue to becoming the creator. So that in the fourth density, all the thoughts are available to everyone else and the type of communication is usually telepathic unless words are chosen. And that there is a great deal of sympathy for the third density illusion and the entities there because uh, they know the sorrows that all of these entities such as we are now have gone through in their incarnations. So the, uh, the fourth density is a, a place where the totality of our being of every single entity is blended together in a huge library of information that then the social memory complex can use as a means of furthering their own service to others. Because when you get into the higher density, that service to others choice that you made in third density is still the choice and the way you progress as a social memory complex. Right. Now, a word that's often used by Kuo and Ra is the is that we're in an illusion. Um, so that, that that can mean a lot of things. I mean, you know, some people theorize, some physicists and, and, and other philosophers theorize that we're in a seeming simulation. And it could certainly um, be indicated by some of the words that Quo uses treating how this is kind of like a game, or even Carla wrote about how this is a game. So I would love to get your impression when they say that everything's an illusion. Are we in a dream? Uh, it, it, what aspect of the illusion? How do they mean? What is your impression after channeling this? when 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 they talk about the illusion austin what do you think um i already spoke uh recently so i passed it to gary <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a a question of perennial interest for philosophers certainly what is real what is the nature of reality and as you note, Brian, illusion is a frequently used term in the Confederation philosophy. So I've considered that question as well. What does it mean that this is an illusion? And part of my own working thesis there is that um, on one level, creation itself is an illusion. I mean, because, you know, if you look at the cosmic genesis story of the law of one, Ra, Don is asking what was at the beginning? before this existed what what was it and uh you know Ra describes undifferentiated intelligent infinity all right what happened then intelligent infinity became aware and discerned a concept what was that concept that it it could know itself thus was born the first distortion the first primal distortion following which um was begotten the second distortion the law of love the law of free will being the first, and then the third distortion, the law of light, etc., and a, a sort of big bang, if you will, ensued, and creation was born. Love, the focus, the creative principle, the second primal distortion, concocted a scheme in its head, so to speak. Uh, Rod describes how it used its thought complex to design uh, basically the octave system, a curriculum, the, the, the process, the journey of the creator becoming many so that the creator could discover itself, uh, rediscover itself as one. So that the creator could breathe outward into this manifest creation and then uh, cr make a U-turn and then come back to the creator uh, like a heartbeat, each, each universe like one beat of the heart. So in, in that system, Space and time were born. Um, mind, body, spirit complexes were born. Uh, the masculine and feminine uh, 
principles were created. Everything is is created. Nothing at at the level of intelligent infinity before, so to speak, it discerned this concept. There was nothing identifiable. <laughs> there were no objects. There were no planets. No solar systems, etc. So, in a way, all that is illusion or illusory. But where I think it's most meaningful to us in third density is not so much that are the objects real, is the tree real, is the bird real, is the mountain real, um, but rather do we see those things for what they truly are, which is the one creator, which is infinity. It is the veil, I think, which is the key ingredient of our, our experience of the illusion. The veil cuts us off from source, conceptually at least. I mean, we're never truly ever cut off from source, mm -hmm. but we live in this sort of fantasy, this hypnotically convincing fantasy that we are indeed separate, that I'm separate from you three and you from me and mm -hmm. and from everything. And then we relate to things from that place of separation. And then in that gap of separation can come fear and can come the service of self polarity, a, a sense, a need to dominate that which is separate from you or to control that which is separate from you. Um, so in short, it, that's the illusion is that that separation. When when the veil is removed, there's still, you know, say for instance, in fourth density, the veil is removed, things, the vision of oneness is once again restored to the eyesight. The constituent members of the social memory complex can see that all things are one, but they still operate in a space Base, so to speak, uh, a realm of separation. They still perceive themselves as distinct. They perceive other selves as distinct, but they understand the substratum underneath everything is one. All manifestation, whether it's a dark entity or a light entity, or whether it's billions of miles away, or whether it's right here, is all manifestation of that one infinity, of that one intelligent infinity. That's how I might tackle it. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you. So, you know, I, uh, I find it fascinating with the, with, when channeling quo, you're channeling multiple higher density social memory complex, not just one, you're multiple. So as, as Carla would say, when, she, when Latouille was around, she could smell oranges or, um, you know, you guys even mentioned, you know, a possibility that when you see a falcon, it might be raw. Do you have experiences like, Hey, raw's in the chat, <laughs> like, you're just sitting there and all of a sudden one of the entities comes in and even though they're saying quo, you can sort of tell a subtle difference about the entity that's answering the question. Do you, is there any subtle flavor of interest or, 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 or explanation for these different entities that you can talk about when you're channeling them? <laughs> I haven't noticed any, Gary, Austin, do you? Um, for my part, uh, so Jim has a lot more experience channeling these different entities. For a long time, when we first started learning channeling, we would channel um, Latos as sort of like a preliminary uh, exercise to get started channeling. And uh, then we started channeling Kuo. Like you're saying, Kuo is made up of three different social memory complexes. My understanding, and I'm curious if uh, Gary and Jim have a different understanding, my understanding is even though they're a principle that's unified, it's typically Latwi that's doing like the relaying of information for Kuo. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't ever change. But I will say, you know, to your question, the biggest distinction I got when we channeled Latos, I felt a lot of um, in terms of like what uh, was called conditioning, a lot of pressure in my like chest area, sort of in my heart center, um, just pressure here. With Kuo, it's less of a pressure. It's just an all-encompassing. Like I kind of feel like I'm getting a bear hug from uh, Kuo whenever yeah. we channel. So um, that's my sort of energetic impression as being sort of enveloped and surrounded, whereas uh, Latos was a lot more just sort of pressure in my chest. Do you notice I'm, anything, Gary? Yeah. I'm too dense to tease apart any uh, subtle differences in the three social memory complex who contribute to Kuo. Um, however, I have to wonder if it's also like, you know, trying to separate out the hydrogen from the oxygen atoms in <laughs> water, you know, are are they synthesized into a whole such that they can't, if broken up into their constituent parts, um, makes it not water. 
anymore or is it like you know um having three friends over who somehow have a group mind and can speak as one but you can still see uh and, and talk to uh or you can sense which of the three friends is contributing to to that group message i'm not right. sure but... so we only have a couple minutes left and i have millions of other questions maybe we'll have to talk again sometime but i find i, I just want to talk just briefly about um uh, catastrophes it's something in the history of channeling if you go back through other channelers um a lot of entities that come out of nowhere hey i want to tell warn you all you know in, in um in july there's going to be this big event or there's going to be this a big event or the world's going to come to an end or there's a pole shift and the beautiful thing about quo is yeah maybe but it's that's not the focus <laughs> and they've really taught me what's important obviously certain things um I, I can ask i can get some information on that conspiracy and, and learn about jfk but that's just I I irrelevant and, and it just goes away. Like, a, you know, it's the deeper, heavier questions that, that will go on forever. Um, and and it, it's so you, you have to, uh, I would love to get your impressions with other entities that are, are channeling. When you read about other entities, oh, they're telling us that there's going to be uh, a big shift or um, is that always a sign that it's an it's negative polarity? I mean, it see, I, it feels like uh, it, it is like some entities that are channeling are uh, seemingly warning about catastrophes that oftentimes don't happen, and it's just uh, a way for us to to create fear. Sh should I immediately judge it? I obviously everything has to resonate with me, but what do you think when you see another channeler um, warning us about an oncoming catastrophe or pen impending doom? Well, they may be talking about something that's going to happen. Uh, the important thing is that they don't put emphasis on it as something that you need to, you know, be aware of in the way of fearing it, or taking you, you know, getting your food together, going to the countryside, and uh, becoming isolated from others so you can survive the catastrophes. You know, Ross suggested that all of that was part of the planetary game, and that it really doesn't have anything to do with why we're really here. We're all really here to make a choice and to use everything that happens in the world around us, whether it looks good or bad, happy or sad, we're here to use it in a positive sense, to process it and to see that it's part of an overall picture. And the greater picture is that we're here to open our hearts in unconditional love, at least 51% of the time, just enough to point the compass in the, in the positive direction. So we can all determine for ourselves what is important if it is in alignment with that learning to love unconditionally and just let the rest of it go because there's going to be some sort of a catastrophe at all times. Uh, this is the third density where uh, the illusion is very strong. The veil of forgetting is very strong and we perceive things sometimes in a way that is not in harmony with the truth. The thing that that Quo had mentioned in a recent channeling that I, that I, that I find as true in my experience, when you connect to the love and light and you're resonating and vibrating at that level, it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside world. It's like a bubble almost forms a, a, around your experience, and and you you tune into the joy of what's happening, and it doesn't matter if there's a catastrophe when you're tuned in to that higher vibration it seems like you're seemingly protected and the, and the world that I'm in is different and I'm being given opportunities to serve within this vibration. I don't know if you, you could, you, you could at least share your experiences. It's not, it's not critical of what's happening in the world. I offer love to the world, but I'm, I also, I feel protected when I'm tuned in to these higher energies and, and what's happening in the world doesn't necessarily matter to me. I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make sense to anyone? Yeah. Austin, what do you think? It, yeah, it does make sense. I do think um, there's a couple elements to what you're talking about. Uh, one is the protective aspect that you're speaking of. And I think that we can see that as sort of like, if we need to be somewhere to avoid something, then we'll sort of feel pulled to be there. Um, that can be a protective aspect. But I think there's another element in that no matter how in tune with love and light we are, there's always going to be some, you know, I don't want to say risk, but a possibility that we're going to experience things that are unpleasant and that we probably don't want to experience. But that's just the nature of our existence here on Earth is that um, even if we are in tune with love and light 100 percent, we might be put in a situation that is difficult and uh, that we would prefer to avoid. But 
we can also trust that since we are in alignment, we believe we're in alignment, that we are being put in that situation for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times service to others is going to require us to be in uncomfortable situations. In order to serve people, we have to be able to step outside of a, a comfort zone and be put in situations that are difficult and are unpleasant and, you know, even dangerous and uh, stuff like that. So uh, the protection can be physical. I do believe that. But I think the more essential protection is not from the difficult situations, but sort of a spiritual protection where we can be in difficult situations and still allow uh, our experience to be informed fully by love and light and fully by our choice of service to others, rather than have that situation sort of push us back and stop us from achieving that uh, alignment that we have. So well said. And, and and I always remember Carla's words, you know, in any situation, when however uncomfortable, I remember I'm the love in that moment, and I'm the secret agent of unconditional love. And I continue to remind myself of that. And, and it's so, um, it's such an honor to speak to three other secret agents of unconditional love. So thank you for joining me today. It's been a real honor. Thank you for the contribution that you've made. Please continue your amazing service. I could never give you the proper gratitude for what you've done for me personally and so many other people that I know that you've changed their lives by the channelings that you've done and the contribution in your website. Everybody needs to check out llresearch.org. Uh, you guys have done some amazing work on the website. Um, it's it's much more easy to search now. You made it so that everybody can search um, different stuff and you have a, there's going to be a new multi-site website available where you can access everything in um, 23 different languages. Um, so you, you continue to refine and, 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 and make the website more amazing. I, I don't think that thank you is the proper word. There, there needs to be some other word that I could, if I could send you my thank you in, in, um, in visual form to tell it in, in feeling form, how much it means to me. Thank you so much for what you've done. All right. And uh, you know, welcome to the reality revolution, everyone. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you so much, Brian. It's an honor and humbling to be here. And also thank you for the work that you do. Um, very, you know, you lighten the planetary vibration. I think it's really important and uh, really appreciate your work. That means a lot. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you for your service to the readership. Um, this The journey of evolution is a collective one. It's a shared one. And it's not just an individual journey. And you're mm -hmm. making your study, whether it's the law of one material or some other source, you're making that available to um, your own readership and sharing in that study. And like Austin said, lightening the planetary vibration. It's an honor to be here. And we are just students of this philosophy too. Hope to talk to you guys again soon and keep up the great work. Thank you. We return you now to your local announcement.